There is a connection between haunted houses, cryptids, poltergeist activity, and UFOs. A unifying hypothesis that seeks to explain why people going through major life changes while feeling marginalized seem to experience the most bizarre paranormal activity. This is a video about high strangeness and the frustrating lack of purpose to the phenomena. High strangeness was defined as a quality of being peculiar, bizarre, utterly absurd by J. Allen Hynek, as a quantifying factor of credibility in sightings of unidentified flying objects. Hynek was a member of the Air Force funded University of Colorado's Condon Committee, which examined what is now called unidentified aerial phenomenon for Project Blue Book, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, and the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization between 1966 and 1968. The quality of high strangeness has been retroactively applied to the works of other authors, most notably John A. Keel, who investigated the Mothman sightings and events that occurred at Skinwalker Ranch that were documented by Ryan T. Skinner. Keel documented the most celebrated case of high strangeness in his 1975 book, Visitors from Space. He investigated sightings of a strange creature that would become known as the Mothman, UFOs, and Men in Black in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in 1966 and 1967. The 2002 film, The Mothman Prophecies, focused on this creature. What was left out of the film are classic elements of high strangeness, including UFO sightings and Men in Black. In his October 1967 article, UFO, Agents of Terror, Kill introduced the concept of Men in Black to readers of Saga magazine. In Nicholas Redfern's 2011 book, The Real Men in Black, he documents how Men in Black antagonize UFO witnesses. He illustrates how encounters with these men aren't just unnerving, but can be very peculiar as well. These men are often reported to be decades behind in fashion and drive older model cars that are usually black. They claim to be attached to the government in some way. Their identities can't be confirmed. However, because their credentials show nonsensical names with no vowels, their behavior is odd, and sometimes even perceived as almost robotic. To add to the confusion, they don't always seem to comprehend the uses for everyday household items. In the Mothman case, men in black frequently harassed local newspaper reporter Mary Hire because she continued to publish accounts of citizens encountering the creature. The film took creative liberties by identifying the Mothman as a being known as Indra Code. This figure, however, was an alleged extraterrestrial encountered by Woodrow Derenberger on November 2, 1966 on Interstate 77 in Parkersburg, West Virginia. The two cities are approximately 50 miles from one another. Derenberger would later work with Harold W. Hubbard to write the 1971 book Visitors from Lanyolos to document his alleged contacts with the extraterrestrial. Keel admitted in the 1984 publication, The Info Journal, by the International Fortin Organization, that he had resigned himself to an interdimensional hypothesis well before his involvement in the infamous Mothman case. He noted the overlap of UFOs and psychic phenomena, and that people interpreted the crafts, any accompanying creatures, and so-called governmental agents through their own beliefs. He abandoned notions that UFOs were from other planetary systems and believed that they weren't even permanent constructs of what we would classify as matter. The interdimensional hypothesis postulates that high strangeness occurs only to challenge someone's notions of reality. In his 1970 book, Operation Trojan Horse, Keel proposed that ultra-terrestrial beings are more likely to cause a high strangeness. These beings are believed to be from another reality and are beyond the realms of human experiences. Keel expanded his perception on these intelligences. In his 1975 book, The Eighth Tower, he wrote that he believed them to be incorporeal and residing in the superspectrum, just above the electromagnetic spectrum. Another proponent of the interdimensional hypothesis was Jacques Vallée, who wrote about them in his 1975 book, The Edge of Reality, and his 1979 book, Messengers of Deception. He writes that ultra-terrestrials don't have physical forms and can manipulate space, time, and human consciousness. Keel, Vallée, and other researchers 
such as Salvador Presido, Amy Mitchell, and John Eric Brigjord believe these non-human intelligences are perceived by humans as any form of extraterrestrial, religious apparitions, or cryptids. They may also have a hand in causing psychic phenomena as well as poltergeist activity. Keel wrote that when those terrestrials who seem to have a juvenile sense of humor manipulate human consciousness to encounter seemingly physical crafts or cryptids, the environment may actually change. A sulfuric smell or what seems to be microwave radiation can sometimes seem to accompany them. This sulfuric smell is a staple in many Sasquatch encounters, but also can occur in extraterrestrial encounters, such as the Flatwoods monster that was reported in Flatwoods, West Virginia since September the 12th, 1952. Liminality is a state of transition between one major stage of life to the next. Pregnancy, puberty, marriage, retirement, divorce, moving to a new location, a death in the family, and career changes are examples of liminality. During these times, high strangeness is more likely to occur. It's almost a cliche that poltergeist activity is associated with the presence of a young lady going through the liminal period of puberty. Objects unpredictably and repeatedly seem to move about the home on their own. Residents are disturbed by strange knocking noises, and items in the home may break. Yet, these occurrences seem to follow a person unlike typical haunted house tales. As early as the publication of Haunted People by Herbert Carrington and Nandor Fedora in 1951, the connection between changes in life and poltergeist activity were noted, but there are a few cases where poltergeist activity is related to the cryptid known as Sasquatch. What can qualify poltergeist activity as high strangeness is when it begins to have similarities to Sasquatch encounters. In some poltergeist cases, stones seem to be thrown at the home. This is called lithoboia, after Richard Chamberlain's 1698 horror booklet of the same name, which documents an extreme case where in 1682, at George Walton's Tavern in Newcastle, New Hampshire, hundreds of stones fell on the building. In a similar incident, in 1924, a group of gold miners on Mount St. Helens, Washington, were tormented by what they called a demon ape who allegedly threw rocks at their cabin. Another cliche in parapsychology is that when a home is undergoing renovations, paranormal activity seems to occur. During renovations, the home is indeed in a liminal state. Marginality is the state of being marginalized which can mean a place located on the border or edge of a town, or a person being isolated from their community or culture. In George P. Hansen's book, The Trickster and the Paranormal, it's evident that marginalized persons, such as minorities, those in the LGBT community, disabled persons, persons suffering persistent mental illness, persons with addictions, those living in poverty, and those with criminal backgrounds have a higher probability of being susceptible to high strangeness. High strangeness is also most likely to occur in and around marginalized lands, such as abandoned pastures, mines, commercial buildings, and cemeteries. As examples, it's well known that five miles from Point Pleasant, there was an abandoned munitions factory, and in the Skinwalker Ranch case, the pasture land had been abandoned for a short time before the Sherman family purchased it. The strange creatures mentioned in incidents of high strangeness could be considered cryptids, or creatures whose existence isn't recognized by scientific consensus. The most well-known of these proposed creatures is Sasquatch, but also include the Jersey Devil, Chupacabra, and the Mothman. In Joshua Cutchin and Timothy Reiner's 2020 book, Where the Footprints In, the authors document cases of Sasquatch that are in the phenomena of high strangeness. High strangeness seems to have a limited period of experience. The phenomena that occurred in and around Point Pleasant, West Virginia lasted almost a year. In his 2013 book, Skinwalker Ranch, Ryan T. Skinner documents the high strangeness that occurred at 512 acre ranch in Ballard, Utah during the time that the Sherman family lived there. Some of the phenomena included poltergeist phenomena, UFO and ball of light sightings, a Bigfoot like creature, crop circles, cattle mutilation, a large wolf-like creature with piercing red eyes that seemed to be unaffected by bullets and much more. 
The phenomenon started when the Sherman family moved to the ranch in 1994 and seemingly ended after Robert Bigelow, founder of Bigelow Aerospace, a space technology startup company, bought the land in 1996. Proponents of high strangeness, caused by ultra-terrestrial consciousness, believe that the whole point of high strangeness is to control the behavior of those who are involved in it by upsetting their consensus of reality. It upsets trust in governing bodies and causes a person to lose or question their faith. It's proposed this is all to make the person investigate the phenomena itself with less biases. Throughout their miniseries, Hellier, Greg, and Dana Newkirk continued to express frustration when researching high strangeness. They documented the elusive nature of the phenomena, but noted that synchronicities or meaningful coincidences were a theme for those involving themselves in the phenomena. During the first season of Hellier, there was more focus on three-toed footprints. They seemed to connect to more obscure cryptids. For example, the Boggy Creek monster of Foop, Arkansas, a Bigfoot-type monster, is said to leave three-toed footprints as well as the three-toed dodo of the Cameroon forest, the Ohio grassman, Bigfoot species from Louisiana and East Texas, the South Carolina lizard man of Scape or Swamp, the White River monster of Northeast Arkansas, and others. In his 1990 book, Perspectives, John Spencer argues that descriptions of ultra-terrestrials conform somewhat to what a witness expects to see. He continues by saying that experiences will fill in the gaps of the ultra-terrestrial with cultural references to make sense of it, even though there's always something very off about the appearance of whatever they're encountering. Perhaps. Children aren't the only ones who learn from watching television. And until fairly recently, families could only access a few channels with the use of the pole antenna, also called rabbit ears, that picked up electromagnetic signals between 47 and 250 megahertz in the very high frequency range. Some lucky families owned a larger antenna that was attached to the top of their homes, which could pick up more channels by picking up signals between 470 and 960 megahertz in the ultra high frequency range. If the hypothesis that ultra-terrestrials reside in the superspectrum above the electromagnetic field, it would be easier for them to access the information streaming to television sets to learn more about us. And that's exactly what appeared to have happened when two children vacationing in Sandown, UK came across one of the strangest ultra-terrestrials documented. In May 1973, the seven-year-olds were vacationing at the seaside town of Lake Common on the Isle of Wight. To protect their identity, the girl was given the name Faye and the boy was named Harry. They were exploring the more forested area across from the then seldom used Sandown Airport and golf course. They were drawn to a wailing sound which they likened to an ambulance siren. Already, the airport and the wailing are important. An often unused airport today would be an attraction to persons taking photos of liminal spaces to post to Instagram and subreddit. And if a non-human intelligence wanted to grab the attention of humans, it had a source to draw from. Only five months prior to the encounter, General Hospital had begun airing in the UK scenes of cars stopping and rubbernecking as ambulances were filmed rushing down roads. Could have translated to an intelligence that the sound was a perfect way to get attention. The children followed the sounds to a footbridge crossing a stream. Suddenly, all sounds had stopped. Not just the siren, but also the sounds of nature around them. The silence in the small footbridge also play a significant role. It's interesting to note that some persons who had been lost in national parks and featured in Dave Pilatus' Missing 411 book series also have reported this sudden and often eerie silence right before going missing. Crossing the footbridge places one in a transistory state going from one side of the creek to the other. As soon as the children stepped on the footbridge, a three-fingered hand wearing a blue glove grabbed onto the side. When they looked over, they saw a humanoid clown comically fumbling with a book in the water. He continued to drop it and retrieve it as if it were some type of game to amuse the children. When it finally stood up, they saw a truly out of this world humanoid. They described it as being seven feet tall with wooden slats stalking out from under its shirt sleeves and pant legs. Its skin was completely white. Both three-fingered hands had blue gloves on, but it had bare feet with three toes on each 
in retrospect, its head and face, which was also pale white, was too large, unmoving and masculine. In fact, the head seemed too large, rounded, and as if the humanoid had no neck, the face looked painted on. The two eyes were hollow triangles outlined in blue. Its nose was a flat round triangle. Its mouth was also hollow and outlined in yellow. A patch of reddish hair hung down from a sort of hat which had two wooden antennas sticking out of it and a black knob on top. Where had the ultra-terrestrials seen these elements before? Or where had the children come in contact with these images so that their brains interpreted what was in front of them in such a way? Perhaps television. This was before clowns frightened the majority of people and were still used for children's entertainment. The serial killer John Wayne Gacy wouldn't be arrested in America for his crimes until 1978. Stephen King wouldn't write his more popular novel It until 1986, so clowns were still a source of joy for the majority of children. And there was a reference to the hijinks from clowns already. A television show featuring a clown called Right Charlie had premiered on May 19, 1972. Also starting on July 2, 1967, Test Card F, showing a happy young girl with her stuffed toy, which would later become known as Bubbles the Clown, would display on television screens when programs weren't airing. The three digits on each hand and foot can't be easily explained. It is true that Steven Spielberg's celebrated film E.T. had a character with three toes on each foot, but the movie wasn't released until 1982. Some researchers have suggested that having no neck is reminiscent of a Doctor Who alien species known as the Santaron. However, the first episode to feature one of these fictional aliens didn't air until December the 15th of that year in an episode called The Time Warrior. The most telling connections to a television set, however, could be seen with the humanoid's hat. The dial on top could very much represent the channel dial on an te old television set, and the antennas, though wooden, could have represented rabbit ears that it would have sat on top of televisions. The children then watched as the humanoid hopped in a very odd way into the field across from the footbridge. The children described the movements as marionette-like. The humanoid jumped with its knees held high and landed much like they had seen astronauts on the moon move. 1969 moon landing and spacewalk footage would have been accessible on television. But there was another reference to marionettes that the children most likely would have seen. Between 1964 and 1966, a science fiction children's show called Thunderbirds, featuring marionettes aired in the UK, reruns would have still been shown on television. The humanoid entered a metal building that had strange windows that was set alone in the clearing across the creek. When it emerged again, it was carrying a microphone connected to a handheld amplifier. It began making the wailing sound again, which almost scared the children away. That was until it spoke, but its voice didn't come from the amplifier. Instead, the children heard, Are you still there? as if it were right beside of them. This is reminiscent of accounts of residents in Point Pleasant, West Virginia during the Mothman sightings. There, individuals had reported walking around in well-populated places and hearing conversations coming from air immediately above them. They decided that the humanoid's voice was so sweet and unthreatening that they would join him outside of this Strange metal building, the humanoid fumbled with his book and then wrote a series of nonsensical words that made no sense when put together. Then, it pointed at words, which read, Hello, I am All Colors Sam. Could the phrase All Colors have something to do with the concept of the super spectrum hypothesis? If I ask why his clothes were torn and disheveled, this time Sam decided that it could carry on a somewhat normal conversation without moving its lips and holding them as a ventriloquist would while on stage, it said, Some have interpreted the association she drew to ventriloquism as evident that Sam was being puppeteered by ultra-terrestrial intelligence. She asked if he was human. He replied, no. She asked him if he was a ghost. He said, Well, not really, but I am in way. When she asked what he was, all he said was, you know. He then told the children that he actually didn't have a name, and there were others like him. He said that they had a larger base on mainland England, and even drew pictures of some of the others like him in the book. When asked why he had left them at the footbridge, he said that humans scared him, and he was afraid that they would hurt him. He reassured the children that even if they did hurt him, he wouldn't fight back. This particularly raises red flags for believers. Why was the humanoid trying so hard to convince the children that he was a pacifist? It seemed to work though. The children used the odd metal flap door to enter Sam's building and Sam followed them inside. But 
This wasn't ending tragedy, as some would assume. Inside, the children took notice that it looked bigger on the inside than it did on the outside, echoing architecture of the fictional TARDIS from Doctor Who, which had been airing since 1963. Sam took off his hat to reveal large white ears and sparse brown hair. The two described the loft as a second story as having a metal floor. The ground floor, however, was wallpapered in a design that looked like blue-green dials and had an electric heater and simple wooden furniture. After a conversation about his diet and a magic trick to show the children how he checked how nutritious the berries Sam collected in the late evening was traditionally something that was avoided in the area because it was believed to be the time that fairies pick berries. The children bid their strange new friend farewell. If John Spencer's evidence that people can only perceive these type of events in context to their own experiences and expectations, could it be that the children had actually entered a UFO? The dial pattern wallpaper could be an indication of just that. They walked onto the golf course where a man was repairing a post. They told him about their experiences with what they still called a ghost, and even though he was in line of sight, he was unable to see the building. Since this unknown man laughed at her, it took Faye a few weeks to report the events to her father. He had noted a change in her behavior, but never a change in her story. Harry's story never changed either, and corroborated Faye's. The father took Faye to the spot of the encounter, but mysteriously there was no trace of where the building would have been. This encounter was reported by her father to the Before a Journal, who also investigated it. The children's stories did not change, and their encounter was documented in the January-February 1978 edition. It would be easy to dismiss the story as children's overactive imaginations after watching too much television. However, why does this strange case contain so many hallmarks of high strangeness, when the children had no idea of these concepts and simply thought Sam was a ghost? <laughs>